All right, well, welcome everyone. My name's Darren. I'm the Director of Lifestyle Medicine and Health Research Centre here at Avondale University College. And, uh, and tonight we actually have two special guests. I've been really looking forward to this and, and I really want to thank you, our guests for joining us. I'll be introducing them in just a moment. Um, but this particular Zoom session, uh, which is, is open to all, is actually part of a unit called Processes in Lifestyle Medicine. And uh, what we've been looking at as part of the postgraduate degree here at Avondale, and um, what we've been focusing on is how lifestyle medicine can be administered. And, and last week we heard from the legendary Professor Gary Egger and, about how um, it can be administered in, in shared medical formats. And he had some other ideas for us as well. But to, tonight, what we're going to be focusing on is what I think is really, and I use the word gutsy, I suppose. It's, uh, I, uh, I, that's not really scientific, is it? Although gut is a, scientific, is a medical journal, so maybe gutsy is okay. But look, I think that um, what we're going to hear from tonight is, is um, are two people which I, I have great admiration for. I think that they're real innovators in this space. And what they're really doing is pioneering um, what I would like to see um, a model that really flourishes here and in Australia and beyond. And that is really setting up lifestyle medicine dedicated uh, practices and clinics. And so we have two guests. We have Dr. Michelle Reese, um, and we'll hear from her in just a moment, and Dr. Andrew Pennington. Um, Michelle's based on the Central Coast. Um, Andrew's in Sydney, on, on, in Hornsby, on the north side of Sydney. And so we, this is going to be fairly informal tonight. It's going to be a bit of a Q&A. Uh, we'll hear from each of them respectively, and I'll be asking a, a few questions. And then there'll be the opportunity for you guys to, to ask any questions that you might like to as well. Because as I said, I really think that what they're doing, it's very inspiring. Um, I think it's very innovative. And it's, it's look, I actually run a lean startup myself. And I understand how tricky it can be to, to get a successful model that works. And so these guys are really paving new, new, um, new way. And they're both very, very passionate about lifestyle medicine and, um, and operating at the forefront of that. So it's a real delight to have them with us. Um, I might introduce them just real quickly uh, so that you get to see them. But first of all, Michelle, really nice to have you here. Do you want to tell us just a little bit about your, your background and, um, and, and what, you, what you're currently doing, just in a, a few minutes, and then we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about um, the actual, your centre. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, thanks, Darren. As I said, thanks for inviting me. Um, you know, um, it's been a pleasure to have known you for all of these years because I think your passion is amazing. So, um, yeah, so my background, I um, originally South African trained and then worked in Canada for um, about 10 years, um, mostly hospital based, and then um, moved to Australia in 2008. Um, uh, and have been a GP, um, started in general practice weight management clinics, um, and then through that met Gary Egger and um, was introduced to lifestyle medicine and just realized this is what I really enjoy. It makes a lot of sense to me. It's the way I like to approach patients in general. Um, and having come from a hospital setting where I did a lot of emergency and hospitalist work and that, you know, you see the you see the end result of people um, with their chronic disease. You know, you see your heart attacks and your strokes and your renal failures and all of those. Um, and I think it's really amazing to be able to now make a difference at the start of all of that. So patients, you know, looking as Gary likes to say, you know, looking at the cause of the cause of the cause. Um, so, um, yeah. And in my work with lifestyle medicine over the last few years, um, it's just been very, very fulfilling to work with patients, reverse their chronic disease, improve their quality of living, um, you know, just assist them with that whole biopsychosocial approach. Um, and I think it actually in the end makes a lot more difference to that patient than just seeing those patients present to ED and you see them for a little while and they're gone yeah. um, and they reoccur. So yeah, it's been extremely fulfilling. So awesome. So I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you some specific questions in just a moment about Lifestyle Medicine Center. Before we do that, we'll just yep. flick to, to um, Dr. Andrew Pennington. Andrew, really nice to have you with with us here too. Andrew, once again, a great advocate of lifestyle medicine and um, is now well actually Andrew, maybe maybe if you can just do a brief introduction yourself. Sure, lovely to see you all guys. Lovely to see you, Michelle. Um, and thanks, Darren, for the invitation. Like Michelle. Obviously, I'm very interested in lifestyle medicine. Um, I guess I've always been interested in healthy living, um, 
you know, as part of my upbringing and background, plant-based diets, their role, exercise, you know, stress relief, all of those things. But probably it became most apparent to me, I think, of the power of it uh, probably around when, just when CHIP was being relaunched around 2012 and 2013, for those of you who know the CHIP program. And I was involved in, in CHIP training and I did the program and I actually really got, I, I was really um, blown away, I must say, by some of the testimonials of some of the people who had quite significant chronic illness. I, I remember um, one of the ladies who had end-stage renal disease and had peripheral neuropathy and, and a lot of problems. And in, in generally in medicine, we don't see any reversal to that. It's just one more, more medication, you know, essentially, okay, next stop, renal transplant. Um, and this particular lady's story of the power of lifestyle medicine saw that she actually, not completely, but virtually completely reversed her, her renal failure and her peripheral neuropathy went away and a number of things went away. And I went, wow, I want a part of this. This is crazy. Like we should be doing this in medicine. So that really spurred me on. And, uh, and then I was at that time, I was working as a rural general practitioner obstetrician in Victoria and um, and really loving it. But then I got uh, a um, an invitation to join a clinic that was being set up in Sydney called Sanctuary Medical Practice in Piermont um, that was, um, uh, or, or at least set up with, by a sanitarium who were interested in doing a health clinic and, uh, and they asked me to be a part of it. And I said, yes, I'd like to do that. So I relocated back to Sydney and, and was a part of that. It wasn't, after a while, I realised it wasn't actually real, like it was trying to do lifestyle medicine, but it probably wasn't as successful as it could be. And there was a number of reasons for that, which I won't go into today. But eventually, unfortunately, it closed. Um, so I had an opportunity to either join a new practice or start my own. And I'd already had a passion for lifestyle medicine. I already knew that I didn't want to go back to doing 10 minute sort of consultation medicine with, with patients because I didn't feel that you could make as much impact on short based medicine. So I thought, well, actually, no, I can choose to practice medicine how I want to practice medicine. And I'm actually going to offer a different um, modality and a different style. And that's longer consults with lifestyle based therapies. But at the same time, I was also learning about the power of nutrition and vitamins and minerals and various other complementary medicine strategies. So um, uh, interesting, I can talk more about that later if you like, but, but what that, um, I guess, offered was, uh, and I'm sure Michelle can probably speak to this as well, it's difficult to attract people to your clinic to do lifestyle medicine per se. Like it's not as sexy as it should be perhaps. And so patients kind of maybe struggle a bit with the value proposition. But when if you have some complementary therapies to offer them, they are interested in that. And there's a lot of people interested in that for rightly or wrongly. And I'm, I don't want to go into that necessarily, but that was where I've also explored. And so what I try to do with my practice is, is do lifestyle medicine histories and, and taking care of that. And often that's all you need to do, but occasionally there's things I need to actually do that complement that um, or enhance that or get them ready to be able to do their lifestyle therapies better. And that's basically what I do in my current practice called Sanctuary Lifestyle Clinic in Hornsby. So yeah, so, lots of things. But Yeah, that's a, that's a great introduction. We're going to come back to Michelle. So, hey, what I want to say tonight is that really, I, Andrew, you mentioned that uh, your, uh, your original appointment really in the lifestyle medicine space was at Sanctuary Health Clinic, which was uh, owned and operated by the by Sanitarium Health Food or Health, Sanitarium Health and Wellbeing Company. And that set up a lifestyle medicine clinic in, in Piermont. Um, and it wasn't successful, you know, by and, and, and not putting criticism in, you know, or laying blame on anyone whatsoever. But, but I think um, just to probably just to brief everyone here, I actually really, and, and you mentioned, oh, I won't go into the details of, you know, what, what may have contributed to not being successful or what may have been able to have done to make it more successful. Actually, um, I think there is some really valuable learnings that come through that. And while I'm really fascinated to talk with, with both of you tonight, and I think that, you know, you know, with, with all respect, this will, will be probably, you know, heard by others in the lifestyle medicine community, many of which might be thinking to themselves, hey, you know what, I completely resonate with what Michelle 
uh, and Andrew are talking about tonight. And I, you know, and I'm not quite sure if I'd, ha I'd be courageous enough to do what they're doing, but hey, maybe I'm entertaining the idea. What's some pitfalls that I should stay away from or what's some things that, that I should consider that would actually help set this thing up for success? So I, I would love if, and obviously, you know, I, I, you, I don't ask you guys to share anything you're not comfortable sharing, but just sort of keep that, that, that mindset on that there are people here that maybe are, are looking to you um, and would love to, you know, receive some learnings from you. So anything that you're comfortable to share that you think might be helpful in that regard, you know, we'd greatly appreciate it. So to come back to Michelle, um, so tell us about your, your or tell us tell us about um, the Lifestyle Medicine Centre now. How did it actually come to be? Um, got a little bit of a backstory, you know, you, you, you mentioned how you, it's really, it's really interesting when people come to Lifestyle Medicine conferences, so it's, it's the same speak. You often hear people go, oh, I just, it made sense to me. And I think Michelle used those words. It just made sense, you know, and, and, it's, and then all of a sudden they say, it's, I found my home, you know, I found my tribe. And, and, and it's very much that, that experience for many. Um, how did you go from that point to where you are now? Because, you know, tell us, tell us about the Lifestyle Medicine Centre and how it came to be. Have you, I think you're on, oh, there we go. You just need to unmute yourself, sorry. There we go. There okay, we go. I'll start again there. Um, so just so to understand um, the other attendees on the meeting tonight, am I talking to GPs um, or is it a mix of GPs and a mixed bag, mix bag in mix here. Bag. Okay, um, so yeah, I think the amazing thing for me was um, then signing up and doing the international board um, certification exam because um, just even going through that, as I was learning those things, I could already start applying that in my general practice. Um, so that was very, very helpful for me. I think it's an amazing exam to do. Um, and it gives you a really nice overview. Um, I, at that stage, I did the first international exam, and that was um, based on the, um, the LMCCs, the Lifestyle Medicine Core Competencies. Um, I think it's changed now to the maybe the um, the foundations, um, and I'm not sure exactly what if there's any difference. But honestly, um, I think the whole overview that the LMCC gave me and the the board exam was incredible. Um, so, where I was at the time in general practice, um, I had set up. Um, I was within a fairly large general practice. Uh, and we had set up our chronic disease clinics, um, and one of them was a weight loss clinic. And um, having set that up and seeing a lot of those patients, um, you know, we started at the traditional, okay, you need diet and you need exercise. Um, but having seen those patients, um, I just came to realize that there's a lot more than just diet and exercise. Um, and then having done the, the board exam, um, there were just so many checkboxes in that in terms of, you know, the whole the whole person approach. So, you know, which I use every single day now in my practice. Um, and I do, um, you know, quite a lot of talks and have been invited to talk internationally on, you know, the whole biopsychosocial approach to patients. Um, and the world is sort of moving in that patient-centered care, which I think lifestyle medicine is 100% the best specialty if you want out there to do patient-centered care. Um, so with the Lifestyle Medicine Center, um, I then set that up. It took me a little while understanding how do I incorporate lifestyle medicine within my general practice. Um, for me, what made sense is I started with shared medical appointments and then I was confused. So how do I combine shared medical appointments with, you know, individual consultations? Um, and then I also realized, but I want a team, you know, I really want a team around me because you see patients and you realize, well, I'm a bit limited as a GP and under the current Medicare billing um, to, um, you know, really address some of those more complex issues that come out. So I tend to see patients in the beginning um, I assess them biopsychosocially. I identify barriers in all of those um, those three um, spheres, um, and then talk to the patient about how we're going to go through over the next you know few weeks and months addressing those different parts of it, and then realize that for those patients who needed extra dietary advice or exercise or um, uh, psychology or life coaching. I could do quite a lot of that and do that as an overview, um, but then they did need a bit more intensive work with that. So I actually brought um, other allied health on board with me and decided to open the Lifestyle Medicine Center. That now, Darren, you may not know, but as of yesterday, um, I opened 
a new practice. So what I've done is I took my um, my general practice and my lifestyle medicine center, and I've now combined it into one location because I was working out of the two. So the lifestyle medicine center was set up as a referral center. Um, so we'd receive referrals from GPs and allied health and specialists um, for weight loss um, and lifestyle modification in that whole chronic disease space. Um, it was difficult for me to work out of the two. So now I've gone and combined it into one so I can be in one place. And we're trying to set a new benchmark in primary care with that whole patient centered approach with on site um, dietitians, with three dietitians, a life coach, exercise specialist who actually is doing exercises on site, um, not just giving patients, um, you know, um, stretching and exercises to go do at home. Um, we have um, the first clinical pharmacist on site. So in that chronic disease space, he'll sit and do medication review reviews. Um, he's part of the, um, so Medicare actually gives you incentive payments similar to a chronic disease nurse to have an on-site clinical pharmacist um, to assist with your chronic disease care plans and everything. Um, so yeah, so we only um, opened that yesterday and I'm quite happy to talk about things. I'm not protective or possessive about anything because I think the more people that can actually do and start um, applying um, this different model of care, especially for our chronic disease pandemics, um, the better for everybody. So, so tell me, Sha, so originally um, you had, like you're in the one, facility, like you had the, the Mingara Health, I think it was, wasn't it? When I was yes. there? And, um, and that was a, like a, quite a standard, um, you know, general practice. General practice, yeah. And then you had an, a, we, you know, a floor above which was dedicated to the Lifestyle Medicine Centre. Yes. So how did you go? Because you mentioned that you were getting referrals from specialists and that. How did, how did that work for you? Did, were, did you? did you have enough, you know, other health professionals that were willing to, to refer on that sort of merit of it? Yeah, yeah. So um, I must say there's a bit of resistance in some GPs. There were a few GPs that were very keen to refer their patients and they're quite open to it. And then you had your other GPs that were um, a little bit, um, I suppose, scared of losing their patients um, because once patients come over and they realize that you are approaching them with a, you know, they, they're not there just as here's your prescription, off you go. You know, we're actually looking after the whole of you and a lot of patients want that. Um, you know, I suppose sometimes they may want to change GPs if they feel that they're finding a GP that um, is a little bit more interested in them. So there were some GPs that were a little bit um, precious over that, but others were actually, and, and I actually made it because it was a referral center. I was very clear that if patients came in um, with other GPs that I communicated with those GPs, I sent them notices to say if the patient allowed me to and wanted me to to say that you know your patient has presented um, I'm not going to bill any of your chronic disease item numbers um, I'll keep you up to date you'll be cc'd in on all the pathology I'm not going to change any medications and I'd often make phone calls to GPs and discuss that and they appreciated that um, some patients came in and didn't want me to communicate with their GP and obviously you know that's their right and I had to respect that um, so that's where GPs are concerned. Allied Health, incredibly supportive. Mm -hmm. um, they probably the most supportive. And then there were a range of specialists as well. So I had cardiologists, obstetricians, um, uh, orthopedics particularly. So, you know, before they do knee replacements or hip replacements, they'll often tell patients to um, lose weight first and then they'd refer them to me. Um, and then I'd work through that until they were at a point where they could then, um, you know, go back to this go back to the specialist and have their knees done the cardiologist would refer because obviously you know they'd see patients and a lot of they would sit in the lifestyle and they have no idea what to do and their gps are not necessarily comfortable or knowledgeable or um, interested in talking weight loss or lifestyle modifications so they'd refer them to me um, and as i say allied health were incredibly supportive so um, I don't do any um, integrative medicine or complementary medicine like Andrew. I just, um, you know, I do um, traditional medicine, but just then with lifestyle as um, uh, as addressing the cause of chronic disease instead of just band-aiding it or just managing it. Yes. So tell me, so in your, I'm, I'm amazed that you're actually with us tonight, given that you've just opened a new centre, by the way, so really appreciate that. <laughs> That's why you I was know. late, sorry, because I literally got <laughs> <laughs> I'm amazed you're here at all. Um, 
Hey, so how many people, how many team members do you have, do you have in, your, in your new centre there? The new centre now is, it's, it's called Life Medical Centre now. So, um, you know, maintaining that life and lifestyle side of things. Yeah. Um, and at the moment, somebody actually asked me yesterday now to count. So we've got 17 people um, as part of our um, centre. Wow. Okay, we're going to come back to you in just a minute. Andrew, sure. um, tell us then, so this is quite a large centre. You were, you were part of Sanctuary, which actually had quite a number of health professionals associated with it too, didn't you? And then obviously I'd say that probably, I actually haven't caught up and had a good chat about how it's going real recently, but I would imagine it comparatively a smaller enterprise. Um, you want, can you tell us about that? Sure, it's um, much smaller what I do. Um, and look, I've, I've, the reason for this has simply been a business model um, uh, scenario. Um, so um, I think you just lost Michelle, did it? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so Sanctuary in Piedmont um, was planning to be a lot bigger and have a lot more you know, facilities and, and interdisciplinary care, which is great in theory. But uh, unfortunately, it perhaps just didn't work out the business model very well, and and it ended up, you know, costing more than it should, uh, and that that's a very sort of um, small synopsis. And there's many other reasons why. But I think there are some learnings there. I think if you do start in lifestyle medicine, um, you need to be prepared to start small. I wouldn't be starting too large, and you really need to not rely on that as your sole source of income initially until you get a reputation that people will be actually wanting to come and see you. Um, so I've, I've been fortunate and I think in reality, I get definitely I get a number of lifestyle medicine patients who come to see me because they want the holistic lifestyle medicine. Um, so I, I have quite a few of those, but I probably get more people who come through the door for integrated medicine. And um, that's, that's what has paid the bills for me, essentially. And I would probably rather do more lifestyle medicine, but it's, as I said to you, it's not as sexy. Integrated medicine is a little more, I don't know, in demand for whatever you want a better term. So I use both of these things. And, and sometimes I've got, to, I've got to make a judgment call where I start with the patient. So for example, even though there may be some excellent strategies of lifestyle medicine, in someone who's depressed, if I can't help them correct that chemical imbalance in their brain first and tell them, look, you need to do more exercise and sleep better and eat better, they, and, and they might go, well, doc, I, I can't do that or I'm struggling to do that. You, you've got to actually offer them something to help them before you can get to that point. Now, that's not all patients, but it's just an example. Some patients you've got to help in, a, in another way before you can get them to really correct their lifestyle. So I, I'm very, um, I guess, adaptable is what I would say there. But so if you're wanting to talk about learnings, one is start small, um, don't rely on it as your sole source of income and develop a reputation. And I, I realise that there are people here in this room who are not um, GPs. There's a number of you who are allied health practitioners you won't you will find it easier to to do lifestyle medicine because for example if you're a dietitian or exercise physiologist you know it's really you are practicing a field of lifestyle medicine already so you you are already going to be having that impact but i would say to you unless you are aligned with the referral practitioners or the people you work with you probably are not getting as satisfied with what you do as you could and you can hear that from Michelle, what she was just sharing about her practice. You know, she's obviously got on board a number of people who really appreciate her philosophy and they feel, hey, I'm part of a team that's of the greater good. So the best example I can use of this is my nurses. So I have two nurses in my practice and they love being there because they're doing something different from the standard, you know, medical practice nursing uh, and it's a little bit easier for them. Um, they don't work quite as hard, um, so they probably enjoy that aspect. Uh, and they get the opportunity to do some health coaching with patients and, and to you know, do some chronic disease management plans, et cetera. So it's very, it's very um, good, I guess, for them. And I encourage them and ask them, try to encourage them to learn. 
Um, and one of my nurses who's since left me had gone on and done a board certification in lifestyle medicine, which I would highly recommend everyone consider doing. As Michelle has said, it's, it's a fabulous way to understand lifestyle medicine holistically. Um, and uh, my other nurses are probably going to work towards doing that. Um, so yeah, so you, you, the model evolves a bit. I've actually, what, what happened to me in, I originally was located in Waitara and I, unfortunately, I also overcapitalized as well. I thought that I would get more practitioners in, more things, uh, more people in and more patients. That didn't happen. Um, and I guess I'm in an area where there's no shortage of GPs. So it wasn't uh, like I was addressing a, an area of health need specifically, uh, even though what I was doing is different. But um, so I've actually downsized. I've gone to a smaller practice now, a smaller location, and just I'm focusing on just the things that I do well. And, uh, and then with time, I may be able to add by either expanding the practice or or taking on, you know, renting another room somewhere or another area of the, of the building I'm in where there is a number of different um, facilities, uh, that's a possibility in the future. And ideally, I'd like to do what, um, you know, expand the concept that I have into other um, places around Australia. Um, but I think, if, you know, this is something you can talk, we can talk a little bit more about, but the financial side of things is really heavily weighs on how you can do this. And you have to think that through that very carefully because it just doesn't work if you can't make a business work. It's as simple as that. So you really do have to be savvy about that. And um, I can give you some thoughts on that. So if you are thinking of starting, for example, in lifestyle medicine as a GP and you want to go out to do that, you, you really have to understand your patient population and where you're going to set up. Um, and, you know, that really dictates the um, billing structure that you're going to charge, uh, et cetera. So in my area, where I'm in an area of Sydney where there's a lot of people who can afford to seek medical health, I have a, a full private fee. I do uh, bulk bill children under five um, for illness consults, but, you know, that's because I still want to do general practice as well as lifestyle medicine. But the majority of my patients are paying a private fee and they can afford to do so. Um, I do have discounts for healthcare cards and, and pensioners, but yeah. So those are things you have to consider. But if you went to set out, let's say, somewhere in Western Sydney where there was a, a poorer demographic, for example, you may find that you have to adjust very carefully about how you bill. Um, and one of the tenants I find is that it's very difficult to do lifestyle medicine quickly. You just, you, unless you do shared medical appointments, which is certainly a good way to do it quickly, but there's some issues over how you build that, et cetera. So there's, there are some tricky things to navigate. Um, but, you know, one of the things as we probably know is it's about the rapport you develop with your professional. So I don't know if you guys have got your own GPs, but you know, if you don't get a good rapport with your GP and you don't trust them, then you're not going to be able to help them shift change. And so a lot of what I do is about developing that rapport, trying to you know, mould myself into what the expectation of that patient has and trying to work out how I can help them and develop a trust. And once I can develop that trust, then it's much more likely that they're going to implement changes that I suggest to them and also help them in motivating them to do so. I say a lot of things, but I'm probably going off track. No, that's really good. And actually, I really appreciate you being you know, quite transparent and, and vulnerable in, in some ways to say, hey, you know, I tried that and that didn't work. And, and I think that, you know, one thing in, in business, they always talk about persisting or pivoting, you know, if it's not working, we'll change direction. And I think, but it takes, when, when you've got momentum in one direction, it takes a lot of courage to change. So they're really good at doing The that. trouble is, Darren, is that this, the medical system is set up as an illness system. It's mm. not set up as a wellness system. Mm. So people come to their doctors when they're sick, not when they're, well or wanting to enhance wellness in general or not when they're wanting to prevent illness except for a vaccination. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that's the whole way the Medicare billing setting uh, is set up. So it's not, you can, you know, pivot it a little bit and I'm sure Michelle can talk to that as well. So it's not that you can't use it, but it's much harder. And let's just use the example of if I wanted to spend an hour with a patient, um, let, let's just be honest with the figures. So the Medicare rebate for that is $110. Um, and if I see 
six patients in an hour and it's $38 for that, then I'm going to get about $230 compared to $110. So you do the maths. You know, you can see if, I, if I'm purely bulk billing, that's, that's the economics of it. It's, it's, um, it's very difficult to make it work to have half a decent salary to pay your staff and pay all of your wages and your rent and everything else to bulk bill in, in doing long consult medicine. Um, so that's why you generally need to privately bill it or you have to have some other income source or generation or incredibly generous staff who you don't pay very well. And that it's just, you just can't do that, so. Okay, so, so you know, really thank you for your thoughts there. So Michelle, coming to you, obviously, I mean, when I went and saw your facility at Mingara, that was a nice setup there. And it sounds like you've expanded upon that. So what's been some, some secrets of success there from your perspective? Yeah, so um, I think what I've done now is I've just brought the two together. Um, so I wouldn't really say, um, I suppose we have expanded because I have brought on uh, the pharmacist and, you know, a couple of extra dietitians and that. Um, I think, you know, and I totally hear what, what Andrew says and, um, you know, he makes extremely valid points, which is really important for everybody to understand, you know, that certainly the Medicare system um, allows for illness and illness is based um, and the Medicare system is based on, you know, I'm the expert, you come in, you've got a few issues, I'm going to make a diagnosis, I'm going to give you a script and off you go. And if you get better, great. And if you don't, well, come back again. Um, it's definitely not set up for spending time with a patient, figuring out, you know, all the parts of them that make them tick and that's um, important in their lives. And it's also not set up for recurrent follow-ups because if you're taking somebody through a lifestyle modification program you see them regularly and they want to be seen regularly um, so what we've done um, that's working for us is we have um, effective use of our chronic disease item numbers um, using our nurses um, and now the pharmacist will be part of that so just understanding how to in in our current medicare structure um, to use that well and efficiently um, and then um, we do use shared medical appointments. So Andrew, um, uh, you know, I don't know, it's, it's nice to meet you because I've heard about you. You know, I think when we do the work that we do, people realize that there are different GPs around. That's not just your normal mainstream GP. Um, you know, I mean, I do do mainstream medicine. As I said, I don't do integrative medicine, but you know, people sometimes don't know the difference between that. And they just realize there's a GP that cares a bit more and has a bit of a different approach and your name gets out there. Um, so I've heard of Andrew um, and people talk very highly of him. Um, so um, I think, you know, I use shared the SMAs as well. And we've structured that in a way that um, we've run oh, many, 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 many. And Andrew is right. There's a big question mark around the billings around that. Um, I've had extensive discussions with Gary and John Stevens and all of those guys, they've repeatedly over the last four or five years gone to Medicare um, and Medicare is not able to come back and say, no, you can't bill um, a group of patients, you know, sitting together back to back, um, you know, they haven't, and, and I've done that billing and I haven't, it hasn't been an issue for me um, yet. Hopefully it won't be, but I feel that if they come and they look at, you know, the service we deliver and the documentation we provide around it and that you see, say, you know, 10 people um, in a group and you bill them, um, you know, for an hour and a half, 23s, what they gain in that time is the, the most um uh, successful part of what we've done at the Lifestyle Medicine Centre is our shared medical appointments. Because what the people gain from that, the, the community that they create within those groups. So we structured those groups so that they had an intensive phase where they really, you'll see week one, week two, you know, they don't know each other. By week four, they're chatting outside in the car park. And by week eight, they're exchanging telephone numbers. Mm -hmm. And then after the the initial eight weeks um, they'd roll over into an ongoing um, SMA type drop. So the digmas, the drop in type programs, you know, and then we had walking groups going and cooking challenge, cooking courses and things like that. And then they connect there again. And even now, you know, we um, closed the lifestyle medicine center for a while, just so that we had the capacity to open the new center. 
And those groups just kept going. You know, those women are supporting each other. They're now swimming together. And, you know, you see Facebook posts. So we engage through Facebook and social media as well with everybody. Um, you know, and they talk to each other and it's like, oh, yeah, you know, I'd never swim, but here I am. I'm in the rain. I'm in the pool. I never started any swimming groups with anybody. They just went <laughs> off and did that, you know, so it's pretty cool. Um, I think in terms of fulfillment, our other um, ways that we've, we've, we've run um, small pilot studies, you know, that um, we got funding for. We're aiming to um, apply for a lot more funding because I think if we're starting to pioneer a new model of care, um, I really would love to see, and I've, I'm engaged in a bunch of talks with people already and, you know, just hoping somewhere the fish bites, um, that we will be able to pioneer a new model of care in the prevention management even and reversal of chronic disease. We need to put that evidence together. I think SMAs are an important way to go there because it's so efficient in terms of you know, in one-on-one in -on -one consults, you say the same thing over and over and over and over again, say to 20 patients or, you know, 10 or 12 patients in an SMA, you say it once to all of them. It's great. Um, plus in our SMAs, um, our programs, are so we do programmed shared medical appointments. And part of those modules are also with, you know, obviously me and the nurse and that in attendance are delivered by the, um, the allied health so we'll have specific diet modules or exercise modules, you know, where the exercise guy actually takes them and does exercises with them in that module. Um, we have psychology or life coaching in that as well. Um, so, you know, that's input that those patients get that they would never otherwise get. Um, and the providers really enjoy it. You know, they love it too. They really enjoy it. And then we work collaboratively as a team. So we actually case conference have patients talk about, you know, moving towards patient outcomes. So it's again, it's that patient centered care. Um, so, um, and then we're also launching, uh, this is new for us, actually, it's not, we've run one um, trial guinea pig corporate um, SMA program in the lifestyle space um, that we were approached by um, an owner of a business um, who was a patient and liked it so much. He wanted to. He wanted his staff to have access to it. So we had a condensed five-week intensive program, and he actually allowed them an hour to an hour and a half of their Friday mornings of paid time to attend um, our program. And um, yeah, and that was really successful. So um, that was sort of a trial, and we'll be running out more probably um, in about two months from now. So that's all different streams and, and part of our SMAs and that's maybe where we're a point of difference too in terms of income is um, although you, you obviously can't dip, double dip you know you can't bill or charge something privately and then run your um, Medicare um, model as well um, we have set up um, part of our SMAs that they get um, they, they pay a private fee and then they get other parts to that so they um, you know, we, we do DEXA body composition scans and a whole range of other things, which I'm happy to discuss, you know, which is what then um, their fee pays, pays for, which is outside and over and above the, the Medicare um, items that we then as GPs charge. Hey, Michelle and, and Andrew alluded to the same thing. So both of you have hinted at this idea of, I mean, Andrew, you have your nurses, Michelle, you got your team, but you're even talking about the relationships that get formed amongst your patients. Um, my question to both of you, I'll start with Michelle, is how critical in, in setting up a, a, a centre like this, a clinic like this, uh, having personnel that are on board, um, that are aligned with that philosophy and that, that, that mission of what you're about? Yeah, I think it's crucial. You know, I think that's where um, a lot of other programs um, fall flat. You know, you see a lot of interdisciplinary programs, maybe in a hospital setting or some way. Um, but if you don't have... Um, passionate people that are lifestyle medicine same minded or um, that real person centered passionate <laughs> way of caring um, it, it's not it's not easy to do you have to have people that enjoy that way of working with patients um, yeah yeah Andrew you could comment on that I couldn't have said it better I mean it's you, 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 it's an absolute must 
that you have people who are passionate about what you do. And this is true in any industry in life, isn't it? You know, I mean, if you go to any industry, you know, you go to the tiling shop and you want tiles and the guy is really passionate about it and he understands it all and he explains it, you're going to probably buy tiles from this guy. You know, it's the same with, with us. If we, if we have an infectious passion about what we do, which I think probably you guys do have, and we have similar staff, you will enthuse your patients. It's no doubt about that. Um, but it is absolutely vital. Mm. Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna run out of time. So what about 15 minutes left? Can I ask you a question? Um, obviously you've shared a whole lot of gems already and, and hopefully this has sparked some, some thoughts and some ideas for some other change makers out there. But um, if, other than what you've already shared with us, are there any, you know, really good learnings for you that were, hey, you know, this, stay away from that, doing that, and, hey, try this, this worked well for me. Any any gems that you could share? Perhaps, Andrew, would you like to kick it off? I know you've already itemised some of those things. I, I'm a little bit um, concerned that I'm talking too much to doctors because I know there's a number of allied health people here. Um, can I ask... I mean, I want to try and address that from the allied health perspective, perhaps a little bit more. Um, I have had a couple of people approach me wanting to work with me um, and they, various of them have struggled to get the financial model working for them. Um, so I, I guess um, that's why I said earlier, you can't necessarily early on rely on if you're an allied health practitioner, rely on perhaps the work out of a, uh, out of a center who's just starting up in lifestyle medicine to, to be your sole source of income. You just can't do it. You'll, you'll, you'll end up bankrupt. So you really got to work in settings where you've got a stable income and then, you know, do one day a week initially to start with or whatever it might be. It might, it, you know, maybe with time, and I'm sure Michelle's very much on board with this, it as, as these type of centres get reputations, as the Life Centre, the Sanctuary Lifestyle Clinic becomes more popular, has more patients, all of that stuff, that we will be able to sustain those kind of practitioners because of the, the increased thoroughfare of patients. That's a big one as a, as a learning from my perspective. Um, and, yeah, look, I, I guess I'd just say just learn as much as you can from those who are doing stuff in the area, like come and spend the day in our clinic, um, come and um, do the board certification, you know, go and do a chip sort of course, what, whatever, it, whatever it is that gets you enthused, um, be passionate about it and you'll find, you'll find somewhere to work in uh, and don't lose the passion. Michelle? Um... I would say um, I get many questions around shared medical appointments, and I know I've now already spoken about that. Um, but I think, you know, it can be daunting for people to go, okay, well, I know how to see patients one on one. Um, how do I actually start shared medical appointments? And, and I'm happy to talk to anybody who's interested. Um, you know, obviously, it sounds like you had your talk last week from um, by Gary about SMAs. Um, I think it's an excellent model when it comes to chronic disease. Um, so I think that would be a pearl that I'd say. Um, other pearls I think is be structured in your approach with patients so that patients are clear about how you are going to take them through their um, lifestyle medical modification process with you. So um, I like to, um, you know, have an inquiry visit with patients. Um, they'll come and because they know I'm a lifestyle doctor. So they'll come and I'll explain to them. Um, okay, so my approach is biopsychosocial, meaning biologically, we're going to do some bloods on you, we're going to see where you're at, I need your history and all that. Our, our nurses do that to start with, um, so that by the time I see them, I've got that information. Um, you know, I, I, patients come and see me and then I'll diagnose, you know, their cardiac disease or their insulin resistance or whatever it is, because um, they didn't even know necessarily that they had that by the time they came to us. So. Um, you know, so we look at things medically and I usually start with that and say, okay, we're going to exclude if somebody comes with fatigue, overweight, um, you know, just not living the best life that they can. I'll sort of say, right, okay, we need to do the medical side of things first, check their iron and thyroid and, you know, all of those other things, um, identify if there are any barriers there. But then at the same time, I explain to them, but we're also going to look at 
you know, any psychological barriers or any social issues. And I suppose over with experience now, I tend to nut into those barriers really quickly. You know, if somebody has had, um, you know, maybe they're in a domestic violence relationship or they've, um, you know, just got real low self-worth problems because of, of whatever it may be. Maybe they had trauma somewhere. You know, I tend to hone in on those quickly because often if a lot of those psychological things pose a barrier to um, ongoing, maybe they emotionally eat. You know, um, I do talk a lot about um, your reward centers and some of those addictive tendencies around your dopamine and things like that. Um, and, you know, patients, if they understand that, it really helps them shift from that external source of reward to an internal driver of reward, um, which really, you know, is quite beneficial in them going, oh, wow, okay, which helps them because you can tell patients, look, yeah, you know, here's your diet, you're going to eat this way. Although I don't like talking about diet, I just talk about a lifestyle. Um, but, you know, this is how we're going to change things. I give them food diaries. That's something that's very helpful. If, if you use a food diary across a week and think about, I'll sometimes send patients home and, and even on the inquiry visit, I'll give them a food diary. I say, okay, great, come back. Um, if, you know, if you're interested in what I've explained to you about how I do things um, and invariably, people always are because they're just so thrilled that you're actually going to look after the whole of them. So I'll give them a food diary and say, okay, come back next week, just chart your, um, your food and your exercise for the week. And so often you get patients and it's so good to then elicit those patients who have um, their barriers maybe is that they actually have no idea how to cook. I've had patients who don't even know how to cook rice, you know, or you look at it across the week and you ask them, so what's the main color? that you see on this food diary. And then it's chips, bread, lots of milk, you know, takeaway foods, burgers, sandwiches. Um, and, and then when you say to them, look, let's try and just change color. Let's just try and make it more colorful for the week. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a penny that drops because it's so practical. Mm -hmm. So look at your day and see if you can get some greens and some yellows and some reds and some purples in there. And automatically there, you're talking about your fresh fruit and vegetables that they've got to bring in. Um, you know, so, oh, you know, I mean, there's just so many things that I can talk about, but, um, you know, so I think coming back, so structure your approach in your own mind, go clear, okay, biopsychosocial, let's find out what's good, let's find out what the barriers are, and then you explain that to the patient, this is how we're going to take you through and make sure your documentation suits that and fits that. Um, have paperwork that you can use. So use your lifestyle medicine prescriptions. You know, um, we, you learn that in the international, in the, in the IBLM exam. Um, I use that on a regular basis. Um, use diagrams. So I've got something where I use a puzzle, you know, and I talk about this patient. This is the whole of you. We're going to talk about the different puzzle pieces. You know, you want this life, this quality of life later. So if you have a barrier or an issue with your food or with your exercise or with your relationships or with sleep or with an addiction or whatever it is, you know, we unpack those puzzle pieces, we'll address each one of them and then we'll put them together. So just find ways for yourself to have structure for you and for your patient. And you know what I just really love, you mentioned that Michelle and you've used the term quite often is this sort of whole of health approach recognizing that, you know, very holistic approach to, you know, the biophysical, social, as you refer to it. I know Andrew is very much aligned with that philosophy as well. And I've actually seen, I think over the years, we've seen an evolution in lifestyle medicine in that space. Um, I remember in the early days, it seemed we were very much nutrition, physical activity driven. And I think partly to the great work of, you know, quite a few different luminaries, but Gary Egger being one of them, recognizing that, you know, things like self-worth as you identified and, and some of these things can be can be major players when it comes to lifestyle change. We've only got a couple of minutes left, so and, and I want to be respectful of your time. But um, you know, the, in the, the wise words of, of Stephen Covey, one of these what seven habits of highly effective people, isn't it? Um, I always think he's, he talks about begin with the end in mind. So perhaps starting with, with you, Michelle, and then I'll, I'll ask Andrew, what does the end look like for you? I mean, do you, do you have a firm picture of, of, of what you want this to look like? What will what will success look like for you? 
Success for me or success for our community and I think the... I think success for uh, the, the initiative you're driving in terms of what do you what do you see for, for this you know, for, for the centre? Um, for the centre, I think I would like to see us work out a model of care over the next few years that can show that it can be done to deliver lifestyle in primary care yes. and an interdisciplinary approach to lifestyle um, management or actual general practice management in a patient-centered way in primary care. I'd love to, um, you know, create evidence or, or, or gather the data around that so that, um, you know, because there's nothing out there um, in terms of data about how do you apply lifestyle medicine or a patient-centered care approach in primary care um, that actually has a, a positive effect on health budget outcomes later, mm -hmm. on community, holistic community wellness outcomes later, on patient satisfaction, you know, so we measure, you know, your PROMs, so your um, patient reported outcome measures of which we also obviously, you know, you've got your biochemistry and your anthropometric measurements and things which you can measure. But, you know, we also wanna measure patient activation measures and patient um, experience measures. You know, all of those things are the way that the world wants to go. They wanna know what's the patient's experience, you know, how are they activating? Um, so I'd like to have the center and our community as a whole really move towards being able to identify the need in that and what patients enjoy and make it about the patients rather I had this discussion with a pharmaceutical company yesterday um, make it about the patients not about what doctors want and what you know the academics think it should be make it about what the patients want anyway you hear I get passionate I can calm down a little bit. good it's good <laughs> we love passion here mm. what about Andrew Andrew for you what is what does the end goal look like uh, well, uh, like, like Michelle, I want to see models of lifestyle medicine working and working well, and there are various models that it could be done in, and so that's very much the, you know, the driving factor behind why I've set up my practice. Um, but, if, you know, I want to see it financially viable long term, um, and I want to see, at the moment, uh, the end goal is to continue to touch people's lives on an individual basis, um, from my perspective as a practitioner, because you know, I can really, I mean, yes, you're in shared medical, you can do more than one person at a time, but still, I haven't quite adopted that model yet, even though I've been aware of it for quite a while, and I would like to be doing shared medical models. But um, at the moment, it's an individual approach for me. And so I, I, I get absolutely passionate about seeing someone go from here to here and their health improve holistically in that biopsychosocial, spiritual, whatever model you're wanting to put on, on it. Mm -hmm. And um, that it's a holistic model that um, essentially allows that person to thrive. Mm -hmm. And I often say to my patients, my job is really to do myself out of the job with you. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, I, I want to get you well enough that you don't need to see me very often. Um, and, you know, it's really shooting myself in the foot in that way. But fortunately, there's no shortage of patients. Yeah. True. Hey, we're going to tie it up there because I, I do want to be respectful of your time, but I want to say, you know, deep gratitude to, to Michelle and, and Andrew for what you're doing. Um, you guys really are leaders in lifestyle medicine and, and I really want to affirm you in that and, and, and what you're doing. And, and I too have a great interest in, and I remember the first time coming down to, to Michelle's clinic there, the centre, um, I, I was just always fascinated because this, this is one way that lifestyle medicine wins. And, and I think that we need innovators. We need people who are courageous enough to step out and, you know, take risks and, and, and chart new territory um, because when that's done, others will follow. And so I just want to wish you all the best in, in what you're doing and, um, and really applaud you for, for your efforts. And we wish you every success. Um, we're, we're cheering for you uh, because this can really make a tremendous impact. And, and to me, the end goal, like you've articulated, Andrew, is to... Is to positively influence people's lives in very profound ways and, and lifestyle medicine can do just that. And so the more we can you know, make that mainstream and get governments to, to listen um, and, you know, and, and particularly the, the funding organisations to get on board, um, then the greater the impact we can have. So 
Hey, thank you so much for your time tonight, Andrew and Michelle. It's been really a real joy to, to hear from you. And thank you for, for being so open and transparent and, and sharing what you have. Um, yeah, thank you very much and best of luck with it all. I'm just going to...